Chapter 12 With the Crusaders The tomb of God before us, our fatherland behind, our ships shall leap o'er billows steep before a charmed wind. Above our van great angels shall fight along the sky, while martyrs, pure and crowned saints, to God for rescue cry. The Red Cross knights and yeomen throughout the holy town, in faith and might, on left and right, shall tread the Paynim down. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the burying place of God, why gay and bold, in steel and gold, or the past where Christ hath trod, from Crusader's Chorus by Charles Kingsley. From the first, the way in which the brotherhood of little poor men grew in numbers was a wonderful thing to see. Within a few years, it had outgrown the settlement in the plain and was a vast company, like a great army sent out to make not war, but peace. The groups of gray brothers were known all over Italy, and companies of them had gone to France and Spain and Germany, and even to the north of Africa. In foreign lands, just as in Italy, they preached their simple gospel, and preached it best by caring for the sick and the poor. Sometimes the brothers were received kindly in the far-off countries. Sometimes they were mocked and stoned, as they had been at home. And in Africa, a brave little band was cruelly put to death. It seemed to Francis that he could not bear to stay where he was known and safe, while his brothers were enduring danger and even death in strange lands. Moreover, his heart yearned over the ignorant and miserable everywhere, and he longed to tell in other places what he had told in Italy, that men should love each other and live at peace, and that food and clothing and money should be for all, not for the few. It was only the gospel of the carpenter of Nazareth, but men had forgotten his teaching, though they built churches in his honor, and though they went to war in his name. In the year 1219, one of the great wars called Crusades, or Wars of the Cross, was going on. The Crusaders were soldiers from Europe who fought in the Holy Land to drive the Saracens away from Jerusalem. That the Holy Sepulchre, where Christ was buried, and the hill where he was crucified might not be in the hands of unbelievers, for the Saracens were not Christians, but Mohadamians. They were brave and able soldiers, however, and many times the knightly armies from England, France, Germany, and Italy suffered terrible defeats in Egypt or in Palestine. Fifteen years earlier, Francis Bernadone would have been the most eager of crusaders. The thought of the long voyage, of the battles to be fought in eastern lands for the rescue of the Holy Sepulchre, would have made him even happier than he had been when he rode out to his first fight. Now, Brother Francis, the little poor man, was no less determined to go with the crusading army, but he went with only peace and pity in his heart, he knew that where there were battles, there would be wounded and dying to tend and comfort. And he hoped that, in the midst of hatred and cruelty, he might find a chance to speak of love and gentleness. He even hoped that he might go among the armies of the enemy and preach to them. The Italian crusaders were to set sail for Egypt from the port of Ancona on the Adriatic Sea toward the end of June. Francis and a company of his brothers crossed the mountains from Assisi and reached Ancona in time to go about from ship to ship, seeking to find passage. Since they were not soldiers, and since they had no money, they were forced to trust to the friendliness of the ship's captains, and, when the day of sailing came, places had been found for only Francis and eleven companions. It was a sad minute, for all wanted to go and Francis could not bring himself to decide whom to leave behind. As he walked with them along the white beach, and looked away over the blue harbor where the ships rode at anchor, he spoke sorrowfully. My brothers, the shipmen will not take us all, 
and I have scarcely the courage to choose between you. Let us seek to know what is God's will. On the beach a little child was playing in the sand, and Francis called him to them. Do you know numbers, little one? he asked. Can you count? Yes, father, the child answered, proudly. I can count more than twenty. Then count me out eleven of these, my brothers, to go to sea with me tonight, when yonder ships set sail. The child did not understand what he was doing, but he went about solemnly among the company, and with his small finger told off eleven brothers, and, at evening, these eleven sailed away with Francis and the Crusaders across the southern sea. On the water the summer days were long and hot. Sometimes the wind died away. The sails hung empty, and the sun blistered the decks. The ships were crowded, and the soldiers were uncomfortable and discontented. Many fell sick of sunstroke and fever, and Francis and his brothers found plenty of misery ready to their kind hands. At night, when the breeze freshened and the great sails filled slowly, when the sky darkened and the stars came out, when the ship's prow and the long oars cut through waves of wonderful, shining light, all the wretchedness of the day was forgotten, and the voyagers made merry. The soldiers sang at the ropes, the crusaders, common soldiers, and knights together, seated on the deck, listened, while someone told a marvelous story of Tristram or of Roland. Then a troubadour would sing some brave and plaintive song, while his fingers made sweet music on an old Venetian lute. Francis was soon known to all, and he found many new friends. Sometimes even the knightly tales were neglected, while the soldiers questioned the little poor man and listened to the story of the Brotherhood of Assisi. Francis was with the crusading army in Egypt for a long time, but we know little of what happened to him. A certain French bishop wrote home a letter which has somehow been kept all these seven hundred years. He tells in it of the wonderful brother Francis, whom everyone reveres because he is so lovable, and who is not afraid to go even into the army of the Saracens. Francis was so fearless and so gentle that commonly strangers and even enemies received him kindly, and he came to be almost as well known among the Saracens as among the Crusaders. But there were some who hated him because he preached a strange religion, which they feared, thinking that it might bring success to the Christian armies and defeat to their own. One day Francis and Brother Illuminatus, who was his comrade at this time, were returning alone from the Saracen camp to that of the Christians. Their course lay westward, and, where the treeless plain rose toward the red sunset, they could see the line of the crusaders' tents. The distance was short, and they had good hope of reaching their friends before darkness fell, when suddenly, from the south, a band of mounted men appeared. As they came near, Francis could see that they were not crusaders in heavy mail, but lightly armed Saracens on swift Arabian horses. They swept across the plain like a flight of birds, and Francis watched them admiringly, for he loved all beautiful things. But the fleet riders had quick, fierce eyes. As they espied the gray robes, they wheeled sharply and fell upon the little poor men, like wolves upon sheep, so the old story says. Wounded and helpless in their cruel hands, Francis somehow made his enemies understand that he wished to be taken into the presence of the Soldan himself, their emperor. Perhaps they were afraid to kill a man who appealed to them in the name of their master. Perhaps they expected a reward for their prisoners. Perhaps even their hard hearts were softened by the sight of the men who neither fought nor feared. At any rate, they finally bound the two brothers and carried them off to the Saracen camp. The next day Francis had his wish fulfilled, for he and brother Illuminatus were brought into the royal tent. The Soldan sat on a splendid throne, and his dress was rich and beautiful. All about the throne stood armed guards, and, at the foot of it, black Ethiopian slaves, 
with shining eyes and teeth. On one side were the Soldan's counselors, his wise men, who could read in the stars the things that were to happen in the future, who could tell the meaning of dreams as the magicians had tried to do in Egypt since the day and long before the day when young Joseph put them all to shame. The wise men wore turbans and long flowing robes. They had white beards and deep-set eyes and solemn faces. In front of the throne stood Francis and his one little brother. They were bareheaded and barefooted. Their rough gray robes were dusty and torn and stained with blood. They seemed no match for the tall magicians, who looked down on them with scorn, thinking them madmen or fools. But the Soldan was grave and thoughtful. He wanted to know which spoke the truth, his learned counselors, whom he had always trusted, or these simple, poor men with their new teaching. The wise men could give no help to their sovereign, and, at last, Francis said, My lord, bid your slaves build here a fire before you, great and hot. It may be that God will show us a sign. When the red fire blazed high, Francis spoke across it to the magicians, If you love your religion better than your life, walk into the midst of this fire with me, that it may be seen which faith should be held most certain and most holy. Then the wise men cowered away from the flames with horror, and covered their faces in shame, knowing that they dared not go into the fire. And Brother Francis cried aloud to the Soldan, Promise me, my lord, for thyself and thy people, that if I come out unharmed, thou wilt worship Christ, and I will enter the fire alone. But the Soldan was afraid, for he thought that his people might revolt, knowing that they held the wise men in great dread and honor. Therefore he hastily sent the brothers with a safeguard back to the camp of the crusaders. But he marveled much at the quiet, gray-robed man who had no fear. End of chapter 13 With the Crusaders Chapter 14 The Christmas at Greccio The beautiful mother is bending low where her baby lies, helpless and frail for her tending, but she knows the glorious eyes. The mother smiles and rejoices while the baby laughs in the hay. She listens to heavenly voices. The child shall be king one day. O dear little Christ in the manger, let me make merry with thee, O King in my hour of danger. Wilt thou be strong for me? Adapted from the Latin of Jacopone da Todi in the 13th century. One night in December, a few years after his return from the east, Brother Francis, with one companion, was walking through the beautiful valley of the Valino River, toward Rieti, a little city where he came often on his way from Assisi to Rome. Tonight he had turned somewhat aside from the main road, for he wished to spend Christmas with his friend Sir John of Greccio. Greccio is a tiny village, lying where the foothills begin on the western side of the valley. The very feet of Brother Francis knew the road so well that he could have walked safely in the darkness, but it was not dark. The full moon floated over the valley making the narrow river and the sharp outlines of the snow-covered mountains shine like silver. The plain and the lower hills were pasture land, and, not far from the road, on a grassy slope, the brothers saw the red glow of an almost spent shepherd's fire. Let us stop and visit our brothers, the shepherds, said Francis, and they turned toward the fading fire. There was no sense of winter in the air, scarcely a touch of frost, and the only snow was that on the silver peaks against the sky. The shepherds, three men and one boy, lay sleeping soundly on the bare ground, with their sheepskin coats drawn closely around them. All about them the sheep were sleeping too, but the solemn white sheepdogs were wide awake. If a stranger's foot had trod the grass never so softly, every dog would have barked and every shepherd would have been on his feet in an instant. But the dogs trotted silently up to the Gray Brothers and rubbed against them, as if they said, We are glad to see you again. 
for they knew the friendly feet of the little poor man, and they had more than once helped him to eat the bread that was his only dinner. Followed by the dogs, Francis walked about among the shepherds, but they slept on, as only men who live out of doors can sleep, and Francis could not find it in his heart to waken them. The sheep lay huddled together in groups for more warmth. Around one small square of grass a net was stretched, and inside it were the mother sheep who had little lambs. There was no sound except the faint cry, now and then of a baby lamb. The coals over which the shepherds had cooked their supper paled from dull red to gray, and there was only a thin column of smoke, white in the moonlight. Francis sat down on a stone, and the largest of the white dogs pressed up against his knee. Another went dutifully back to his post beside the fold where the mothers and babies slept. The Italian hillside seemed to Francis to change to that of Bethlehem, which he had seen, perhaps, on his eastern journey. The clear December night seemed like that of the first Christmas Eve. How these shepherds sleep, he thought. How they would awaken if they heard the peace on earth of the angel's song. Then he remembered sadly how the armies that called themselves Christians had year after year battled with the Saracens over the cradle and the tomb of the Prince of Peace. The moonlight grew misty about him. The silver heights of the mountains and the silver line of the river faded, for the eyes of Brother Francis were full of tears. As the two brothers went on their way, Francis grew light of heart again. The sight of the shepherd sleeping on the grass had given him a new idea, and he was planning a surprise for his friends at Greccio. For at Greccio all were his friends, from Sir John, his host, down to the babies in the street. In the valley of Rieti he was almost as well known and as dearly loved as in his own valley of Assisi. The children of Greccio had never heard of Christmas trees, nor perhaps of Christmas presents. I am not sure that in the thirteenth century Italians had the beautiful custom which they now have of giving presents at Twelfth Night in memory of the coming of the three kings with their gifts to the Christ child. But in the thirteenth century, even as now, Christmas was the happiest festival of the year. This year all the folk of Greccio, big and little, were happier than usual because their beloved brother Francis was to help them keep their Christmas tide. Next day, Francis confided his plan to his friend Sir John, who promised that all should be ready on Christmas Eve. On the day before Christmas, the people came from all the country around to see and hear Brother Francis. Men, women, and children, dressed in their holiday clothes, walking, riding on donkeys, crowding into little carts, drawn by great white oxen, from everywhere and in every fashion, the country folk came toward Greccio. Many came from far away, and the early winter darkness fell long before they could reach the town. The light of their torches might be seen on the open road, and the sound of their singing reached the gates of Greccio before them. That night the little town was almost as crowded as was Bethlehem on the eve of the first Christmas. The crowds were poor folk, for the most part peasants from the fields, charcoal burners from the mountains, shepherds in their sheepskin coats and trousers made with the wool outside so that the wearers looked like strange, two-legged animals. The four shepherds, who had slept so soundly a few nights before, were of the company, but they knew nothing of their midnight visitors. The white dogs knew, but they could keep a secret. The shepherds were almost as quiet as their dogs. They always talked and sang less than other people, having grown used to long silences among their sheep. Gathered at last into the square before the church, by the light of the flaring torches, for the moon would rise late, the people saw with wonder and delight the surprise which Brother Francis and Sir John had prepared for them. They looked into a real stable. There was the manger full of hay, there were a live ox and a live ass. Even by torchlight their breath showed in the frosty air. And there, on the hay, lay a real baby, wrapped from the cold, asleep, and smiling. It looked as sweet and innocent 
as the Christ child himself. The people shouted with delight, they clapped their hands, and waved their torches. Then there was a silence, for Brother Francis stood before them, and the voice they loved so well, and had come so far to hear, began to read the old story of the birth of the child Jesus, of the shepherds in the fields, and of the angel's song. When the reading was ended, Brother Francis talked to them as a father might speak to his children. He told of the love that is gentle as a child, that is willing to be poor and humble as the baby who was laid in a manger among the cattle. He begged his listeners to put anger and hatred and envy out of their hearts this Christmas Eve, and to think only thoughts of peace and good will. All listened eagerly while Brother Francis spoke, but the moment he finished, the great crowd broke into singing. From the church tower the bells rang loud, the torches waved wildly, while voices here and there shouted for Brother Francis and for the blessed little Christ. Never before had such glorious hymns nor such joyous shouting been heard in the town of Greccio. Only the mothers with babies in their arms and the shepherds in their woolly coats looked on silently and thought, We are in Bethlehem. End of chapter 14 The Christmas at Greccio Chapter 15 La Verna The story of the troubadour is almost finished. The last years of his life were years of suffering and sorrow. Now that the brotherhood had grown so large, many of its members were forgetting the teaching of their leader. Instead of serving Lady Poverty, they were serving Lady Wealth, or Lady Pride, or Lady Fame, and they were little poor men only on the outside, in their coarse gray robes and their unshod feet. This change in his brother's well nigh broke the heart of Francis of Assisi. He remembered the first winter in the hovel at Rivo Torto, when, in spite of cold and want, the little company had been so happy and so united. He remembered the joy with which they had built the huts in the plain, and had planted their tiny gardens. It seemed to him that his children were scattered far and wide over the world, that they were no longer simple servants of all who needed help but that each was striving for his own comfort and his own gain. There came back to him an old dream. He had dreamed of a little black hen who had so many chickens that she could not gather them all under her wings. Some would be left out to die of cold or to be stolen by the fox. Even in his grief, Francis smiled over his dream. I am the little hen, he thought, and I cannot any longer shelter my brood. Besides his sorrow, Francis had much illness and pain to bear. His body, Brother Ass, as he sometimes called it, was worn and weak, but his heart was brave, and his spirit was always sweet. In those days, sick people could not have the help and comfort that doctors and nurses have learned to give. There was no ether nor chloroform to put a patient out of pain, and surgery was horribly cruel. Once, when Francis was exceedingly ill, the doctors decided that they must burn his forehead with a hot iron. As the surgeon came close to him with a terrible rod, heated till it looked white and quivering, Francis shrank away fearfully for a minute. Then he lifted his hand and said cheerily, Brother Fire, thou art one of the most beautiful of all things. Help me in this hour. Thou knowest how I have always loved thee. Be courteous to me today. The brothers, unable to bear the sight, had gone to the next room. A moment later, they came back, and Francis, smiling on them, said, Why did you run away in such a cowardly fashion? I have not felt the pain. He added, Brother doctor, if it is necessary, you may begin again. One great joy remained to Francis almost until the end, the joy of being out of doors. His love for a life under the sky, his love for birds and flowers, for long journeys through the river valleys or among the high mountains, never left him. One mountain he loved best of all. It is called La Verna, and it stands wild and beautiful among the Tuscan Apennines. 
a certain Count Orlando, to whom all the region belonged, had once heard Brother Francis preach, and had said to him, I have a mountain in Tuscany. It is a silent and lonely place, where one might rest and think and pray. If you would like it, I will gladly give it to you and to your brothers. The old story says that Brother Francis was greatly pleased by this gift of the mountain. He thanked first God, and then Messer Orlando, and he promised that when he should return to the Portiuncula, he would send some of the brothers to Messer Orlando, at his castle of Chiusi. This castle stood, and its roofless walls still stand, where the road begins to climb to La Verna. So it happened that when Count Orlando went home, he was visited by two grey brothers from Assisi, come to see if, in the forest of La Verna, they might find a fit place for Brother Francis. Count Orlando received the two brothers with the greatest joy and friendliness, and, because the mountain was filled with wild beasts, he sent armed men to escort the strangers. The little poor men, with their guard of soldiers, searched about on the steep, rocky mountain, till they found a small level place, like a natural terrace, looking off to the southwest. Here, they said, is the right spot. Let us build huts for ourselves and for our brothers. The soldiers of Count Orlando began to cut down great branches from the fir trees and beeches, and with these they helped the brothers to make rude shelters. Then startled eyes looked out from the green shadows, and soft feet rustled away over the fallen leaves, and a thousand pair of wings made a whirring sound, for all the wild things of La Verna were disturbed by the loud voices and the ringing axes of Count Orlando's soldiers and Brother Francis was not there to understand and comfort them. When the green, sweet-smelling huts were finished, the two brothers, with their guard of soldiers, went back to the castle of Chiusi to thank Count Orlando for his gift. Then they journeyed down to the plain of Assisi, and reported to Brother Francis that the Tuscan mountain was the fittest place in the world in which to think and pray. Brother Francis rejoiced at the account of the two brothers, and he thought it good that a company of the poor men should keep at La Verna the feast of St. Michael and all angels, which comes at the end of September. He started out bravely on foot, as of old, but during the long, rough journey he became so weak that the brothers were forced to ask help of a peasant who was riding upon an ass. The peasant gave his beast to the sick man, and walked beside him all the way, until they reached the sheer grey crags below the little huts that Count Orlando's soldiers had built. Here they rested under an oak tree before making the steep climb. Brother Francis sat looking about the place of which he had heard so much, and, says the story, as he was looking and thinking, there came great flocks of birds from every direction, singing and beating their wings, and they showed signs of joy and welcome. They circled around Francis, so that some perched on his head, some on his shoulders, on his arms, in his lap, and even on his feet. His companions and the peasant saw them with wonder, but Francis said, all happy of heart, I believe, dearest brothers, that our Lord Jesus Christ is pleased that we are to live in this lonely mountain, since our sisters and brothers the birds show such joy at our coming. The little company lived for some weeks on the mountain. Apart from the others, that he might be more alone, Francis had a tiny hut, and here he spent much time in prayer. Only Brother Leone was allowed to come to him, before dawn each day, bringing his scant food. His only other comrade was a falcon, whose shrill cry used to wake him long before light. But sometimes, when Brother Francis worn and ill, lay sleeping, Brother Falcon, like a person discreet and pitiful, would be silent until later in the morning. The forest was full of singing birds, but sweeter music than theirs sounded sometimes in the ears of the little poor man, who, growing weaker and weaker in body, fixed his mind more and more on the glory and the joy of the heavenly life. Once, as he thought on these things, 
longing to know what heaven might be like, he saw before him a most beautiful angel, with a viol in his left hand and a bow in his right. As Francis gazed, wondering, the angel touched the strings with the bow, and so soft a melody was heard that the spirit of Francis was filled with sweetness, and he forgot all his pain of body and mind. One morning, in the house before sunrise, Francis was kneeling in prayer not far from his hut, when a light shone in the heaven above him, and came nearer and nearer, and, behold, it was a seraph with six wings shining and a flame. As the seraph came nearer in swift flight, he seemed to Francis like the figure of a man crucified. Two wings were lifted above his head, and two outstretched in flight, and two were folded down, covering all his body. And Francis was filled with fear, and yet with great joy. Then all the mountain of La Verna seemed to burn with the rosiest flame. The flame shone out and lighted all the hills and valleys far away, as if it were the red light of dawn. The shepherds, watching their flocks, were frightened to see the mountain all ablaze, and afterward they declared that the flame had lasted on La Verna for an hour and more. The light shone even into the windows of the low houses and little inns in the country round about, so that some mule drivers, who were sleeping at an inn not far away to the west, rose and saddled and loaded their mules, thinking that it was day. As they went on their journey, they were astonished to see the beautiful light fade away over La Verna, and, after an hour of darkness, the real sun rise. If the shepherds on the hills and the muleteers going sleepily along the road wondered and feared because of the great light that was not dawn, the brothers on La Verna wondered still more. But Brother Francis knew what the vision meant. Often in these last years his life had seemed a failure, and sometimes he had envied the martyrs of the early church, and even his own brothers, who had given their lives for the faith in Africa and in Spain. Now the vision of pain and glory seemed to say to him, Be content, little poor man, for not by the martyrdom of thy body, but by the fire of thy spirit thou art made like to thy master Christ. And the brothers, who wrote down the story tell how, from that wonderful hour upon the mountain, their beloved leader bore on his hands and on his feet marks like the nail prints of the crucified. End of chapter 15, La Verna Chapter 16, The Troubadour's Last Song Almost the first we know of St. Francis of Assisi, is the story of the sweet-voiced lad who liked to sing gay songs of love and war. Almost the last that we know of him is the more beautiful story of the song which he made and sang only a little while before he died. He had been terribly ill, he was weak and sad and in great pain. But one morning his friends heard the wonderful voice, strong and clear as of old, singing words that they had never known. He had often sung the sweet old Latin hymns, but these words were Italian, and so simple that it seemed as if the singer had made them as he sang, and so he did. The weary, suffering man was still at heart the troubadour. He was still, as he used to call himself, the lark, and, like the lark, he sang for sheer happiness and praise. It is not easy to put the quaint old Italian into English. The beauty and the music seem to disappear. The last song of God's troubadour, the song that cheered his hours of pain and comforted the friends who loved him, was a song of the sun. O Lord, we praise thee for our brother son, who brings us day, who brings us golden light. He tells us of thy beauty, Holy One. We praise thee too, when falls the quiet night, for sister moon and every silver star that thou hast set in heaven, clear and far. For our brave brother wind we give thee praise, for clouds and stormy skies, for gentle air, and for our sister water, cool and fair, 
who does service in sweet, humble ways, but when the winter darkens bitter cold, we praise thee every night and all day long. For our good friend, so merry and so bold, dear brother fire, beautiful and strong, for our good mother earth, we praise thee, Lord, for the bright flowers she scatters everywhere, for all the fruit and grain her fields afford, for her great beauty and her tireless care. It was through this Song of the Sun that the last great joy of his life came to Francis. He was the guest of the Bishop of Assisi in the same place where, so long before, he had gone with the story of his father's anger and his mother's grief. Bishop Guido must have been an old man now, but he was, as always, impulsive and hot-tempered. He had kept a certain love for Francis all these years, but, with most of his neighbors, he was often at odds. Just now a sharp feud was going on between the bishop and the governor of the city, and all of Assisi was in tumult. Francis loved his native town, and he loved peace with all his heart, and this quarrel meant to him the deepest sorrow. His days were full of suffering, but he forgot himself, and only prayed that he might make peace before he died. One day he called a brother to him and said, Go to the governor and beg him to come with all the chief men of the city to the porch before the bishop's palace. The governor came at this request from the dying Francis, and when the bishop stepped out at his palace door, he found himself in a gathering of the very men with whom he was at strife. Just at that moment two gray brothers came forward before the two proud enemies and one said, My lords, Brother Francis has made a song for the praise of God, and he begs you will all listen to it. And they began to sing the song of the sun. They sang the praise of sun and moon, of wind and fire, of sister water and mother earth. And then their voices rose higher and sweeter in a new stanza that Francis, in his longing for peace, had added. We praise thee, Lord, for gentle souls who live in love and peace, who bear with no complaint all wounds and wrongs, who pity and forgive, each one of these, most high, shall be thy saint. The old story tells that the governor listened, standing humbly, weeping hot tears, for he greatly loved the blessed Francis. When the song was finished, Know in truth, he said, that I pardon the Lord Bishop, whom I wish and ought to regard as my lord, for even if someone had murdered my brother, I should be ready to forgive the murderer. After these words he threw himself at the feet of the bishop and said to him, Behold me, ready to do all that you wish, for love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for his servant Francis. Then the bishop, taking him by the hand, lifted him and said, In my calling I ought to be humble but since I am by nature too quickly angry, you must pardon me. A few days later, Brother Francis was carried out from the bishop's palace and borne tenderly down the familiar road toward the Porti Uncula. At the leper hospital, he asked his bearers to halt, and he looked back with dim eyes, lovingly, and lifting his feeble hand, he blessed Assisi. Then the gray procession entered the forest and passed softly through the fallen leaves to the poor huts and the bright garden which had been the dearest home of the brotherhood. And here the troubadour, the little poor man, died, happy and high-hearted, singing praise at the last for the welcome coming of our sister death. In Umbria Under a roof of twisted boughs and silver leaves and noonday sky, among gaunt trunks where lizards house, on the hot sunburnt grass I lie. I hear soft notes of birds that drowse, and steps that echo by, unseen along the sunken way, that drops below the city wall, not of today nor yesterday, the hidden holy feet that fall. O whispering leaves, beseech them stay, O birds, awake and call. Say that a pilgrim, journeying long, from that loud land that lies to west, 
where tongues debate of right and wrong would be the little poor man's guest would learn the lark's divine sun song and how glad hearts are blessed say master we are of overseas confess that oft our hearts are set on gold and gain and if with these for lore of books we strive and fret perchance some lore of bended knees and sainthood we forget still in one thought our lips are bold that in our world of haste and care through days whose hours are bought and sold days full of deeds and scant of prayer of thy life's gospel this we hold the hands that toil are fair therefore forgive a soil each stain of trade and hate of war and wrath teach us thy tenderness for pain thy music that no other hath thy fellowship with sun and rain and flowers along thy path thou dost not answer down the track where now i thought my feet must pass with patient step and burden back go brother ox and brother ass a mountain cloud looms swift and black or shadowing stone and grass the silver leaves are turned to gray there comes no sound from hedge nor tree only a voice from far away born o'er the silent hills to me entreats be light of heart to-day to-morrow joy shall be the glad of heart no hope betrays since mother earth and sister death are good to know and sweet to praise i hear not all the far voices saith of love that trod green umbrian ways and streets of nazareth end of chapter 16 the troubadour's last song end of god's troubadour the story of saint francis of assisi by sophie jewett